chapter one of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter one the rain set early in to-night it had been raining all the morning and it was raining still in that feeble and desultory manner which presages a change of some kind when the postman came with the long-expected indian letter he was later than usual it was nearly two o'clock and isla had been watching for him since one watching with an unread book in her lap listening for the click of the gate she had been sitting by the open window looking out at the wet landscape the glistening hedgerow and dull grey river with the great green hill beyond a steep slope of meadowland dotted with red cattle and so divided by hedgerows as to look like a titanic chessboard at last she heard the familiar tread of the postman's heavy boots and saw his shining oilskin hat moving above the edge of the hollies and heard the click of the iron latch as he came into the little garden she called to him from the window and he came tramping across the sodden grass and put three letters into her outstretched hand one from her married sister in hans place that would keep one from an old schoolfellow that would keep and one the long-looked-for indian letter which she tore open eagerly and read hurriedly devouring the close lines in the neat black penmanship with its decided up-and-down strokes and legible characters so firm so strong so straightforward like the nature of the man who wrote the letter the tears sprang to her eyes as she came to the end and her hands crushed the thin paper in a paroxysm of vexation or despair six months perhaps a year before he can come back and i am to go on living here alone unless i like to send for a girl whose face i hardly know to keep me company and cheer me with her good spirits i want no strange girls i want no one's good spirits i hate people with good spirits i want him and nobody but him it is hard that we should be parted like this i ought to have gone with him in spite of all the doctors in christendom she relented towards the letter which her feverish hand had used so badly she smoothed out the flimsy paper carefully with that pretty little hand and then she re-read the husband's letter so full of grave tenderness and fond consoling words he was with his regiment in burma and the present aspect of things gave him no hope of being able to return to england for the next half-year and there was no certainty that the half-year might not be stretched into a whole year the separation could not be more irksome to his dearest isla than it was to him her husband of little more than a year but not for worlds would he have exposed her to the risks of that climate he took comfort in thinking of her in the snug little cornish nest with his good tabitha isla kissed the letter before she put it in her pocket and then she looked round the room rather dolefully as if the cornish nest was not altogether paradise and yet it was a pretty little room enough half dining-room half study with handsomely bound books on carved oak shelves and photographs and bright draperies and cosily cushioned bamboo chairs and a bird-cage and a persian cat nor was the garden outside flowerless even on the threshold of winter the purple blossoms of the veronica were untouched by frost there were pale tea-roses gleaming yonder against the dark gloss of holly and laurel there were single dahlias of vividest red like flaming stars and close under the open window last splendour of departed summer the waxen chalice of a golden lily 
trembled on its tall stem and filled the room with perfume the rain was over the monotonous drip drip which had irritated isola's nerves all that morning had ceased at last she left the modest little lunch untouched upon the table and went out into the hall where her hat and jacket hung handy for any impromptu ramble no need to look at one's self in the glass before going out of doors at twenty years of age and in such a place as trelasco isla took her stick from the stand a green orange stick bought in the sunny south on her way to venice with her husband last year a leisurely trip which had been to them as a second honeymoon after a few happy months of wedlock then had come the sadness of parting and a swift and lonely journey for the young wife a lonely return to the angler's nest trelasco that cosy cottage between lostwithiel and fowey which major disney had bought and furnished before his marriage he was a son of the soil and he had chosen to pitch his tent in that remote spot for the sake of old associations and from a fixed belief that there was no locality of equal merit for health beauty and all other virtues which a man should seek in his home isola rarely touched that stick without remembering the day it was bought a rainy day in milan just such a day as this a low grey sky and an oppressive mildness of atmosphere she remembered with the sick pain that goes with long partings how she and her husband had dawdled away an afternoon in the victor emmanuel gallery buying handkerchiefs and neckties a book or two a collection of photographs and finally the orange stick she went out to walk down her depression before tea-time if possible she went along a narrow path by the river then turned into a road that skirted those green pastures which rose sheer till the ragged edge of the topmost boundary seemed to touch the dim grey sky she passed the village inn deadly quiet at this season and at this hour she passed the half-dozen decent cottages and the three or four genteeler houses each in its neatly kept garden and she walked with quick light step along the wet road her useful tailor gown well clear of the mud her stick striking the hedgerow now and then as she swung it to and fro in dreamy thought a long lonely winter to look forward to a winter like the last with her books and drawing-board and her cottage piano and the cat and the fox terrier and tabitha for her daily companions there were a few neighbours within a radius of half a dozen miles who had been very civil to her who called upon her say once in six weeks who sometimes invited her to a stately dinner-party and sometimes at a suspiciously short notice which made her feel she was wanted to fill a gap who made her free of their tennis lawns and who talked to her on sundays after church and were always very particular in inquiring for news from india there was not one among them for whom she cared not one to whom she would have liked to pour out her thoughts about keats or shelley or to whom she would have confided her opinion of byron she was more interested in bulwer's oddly edgerton than in any of those flesh-and-blood neighbours she was happier sitting by her chimney-corner with a novel than in the best society available within a drive of trelasco she struck off the high road into a lane a lane that led to the base of a wilder hill than that where the red cattle were grazing the crest of the hill was common land and dark fir trees made a ragged line against the autumn sky and the view from the summit was wide and varied with a glimpse of the great brown cliffs and the dark grey sea far off to the west to that dim distance where the dodman shut off the watery way to the new world on the landward slope of that wild-looking ridge was the mount 
lord lostwithiel's place uninhabited for the greater part of the year except by servants his lordship being the very last kind of man to bury himself alive in a remote cornish fastness a long day's journey from the london theatres and the r y s club-house at cowes who was lord lostwithiel well in the estimation of trelasco he was the only nobleman in england or say that he was to all other peers as the sun to the planets he belonged to trelasco by reason of his large landed estate and the accident of his birth which had taken place at the mount and although his character and way of life were not altogether satisfactory to the village mind trelasco made the best of him isola disney climbed the hill an easy matter to light-footed twenty she stood amidst the tall fir columns and looked down at the november landscape very distinctly defined in the soft grey atmosphere she could see the plough moving slowly across the red earth in the fields below the clumsy farm horses white against the deep rich red she could see the winding river bluish-grey between its willowy banks and far off beyond fowry there rose the wooded hills where the foliage showed orange and tawny and russet between the blue-grey water and the pale grey sky she loved this lonely hill and felt her spirits rise in this lighter atmosphere as she stood resting against the scaly trunk of a scotch fir with the wind blowing her hair it was a relief to escape from the silence of those empty rooms where she had only the sleepy persian or the hyper-intelligent fox terrier for company there was a longer and more picturesque way home than that by which she had come she could descend the other side of the hill skirt the gardens of the mount by a path that led through the park to a lodge gate on the fowry road it was one of her favourite walks and she was so accustomed to seeing the shutters closed at the great house that she never expected to meet any one more alarming than a farm servant or a cottager's child there was a thick chestnut copse upon one side and the wide expanse of undulating turf with an occasional clump of choice timber upon the other the house stood on higher ground than the park but was hemmed in and hidden by shrubberies that had overgrown the intention of the landscape gardener who planned them only the old grey stone gables with their heavy slabs of slate and the tall clustered chimneys showed above the copper beeches and deodaras the laurels and junipers and irish yews and the shining masses of arbutus with crimson berries gleaming amongst the green isla had never seen that old manor house nearer than she saw it to-day from the path which was a public right-of-way through the park she knew that the greater part of the building dated from the reign of charles the second but that there were older bits and that about the whole and about those ancient rooms and passages most especially there were legends and traditions and historical associations not without the suspicion of ghosts the mount was not a show-place like the home of the treffries at fowry and of late years it had been very seldom inhabited except by certain human fossils who had served the house of halbert for two generations she had often looked longingly at those quaint old gables those clustered stone chimneys likening the house amidst its overgrown shrubberies to the palace of the sleeping beauty and had wished that she were on friendly terms with one of those drowsy old retainers i dare say if i were daring enough to open one of the doors and go in i should find them all asleep she thought and i might roam all over the house without awakening anybody she was too depressed to-day to give more than a careless unseeing glance at those many gables as she walked along the muddy path beside the dripping copse 
the chestnut boughs were nearly bare but here and there clusters of bright yellow leaves were still hanging shining like pale gold in the last watery gleams of the sun and though the leaves were lying sodden and brown among the rank wet grass there were emerald mosses and cool green ferns and red and orange fungi to give colour to the foreground and to the little vistas that opened here and there amidst the underwood those final yellow gleams were fading low down in the western sky as isola turned her face towards the river and the angler's nest and just above that pale radiance there stretched a dense black cloud like a monstrous iron bar which she felt must mean mischief she looked at that black line apprehensively she was three miles from home without cloak or umbrella and with no available shelter within three quarters of a mile she quickened her pace watching the fading light and lowering cloud expecting thunder lightning hail she knew not what a sudden deluge settled the question torrential rain that was the meaning of the inky bar above the setting sun she looked round her helplessly should she dart into the copse and try to shelter herself amidst those leafless twigs those slender withies and saplings better to face the storm and plod valiantly on her neat little cloth gown would not be much the worse for a ducking her neat little feet were accustomed to rapid walking should she run no useless when there were three miles to be got over a brisk steady tramp would be better but brave as she was that fierce rain was far from pleasant it cut into her eyes and blinded her she had to grope her way along the path with her stick pray let me take you to the house said a voice close beside her a man's voice low and deep and with the accents of refinement could one of lord lostwithiel's fossilized servants talk like that impossible she looked up as well as she could under that blinding downpour and saw a tall man standing beside the pathway with his back to the copse he was over six feet two and of slim active figure he was pale and wore a short dark beard and the eyes which looked at isola out of the pale thin face were very dark that was about as much as she could see of the stranger in the november dusk pray let me persuade you to come to the house he said urgently you are being drenched it is absolutely dreadful to see anybody out in such rain and there is no other shelter within reach let me take you there my housekeeper will dry your hat and jacket for you i ought to introduce myself perhaps i am lord lostwithiel she had guessed as much who else would speak with authority in that place she dimly recalled a photograph pale and faded of a tall man in a yeomanry uniform seen in somebody's album and the face of the photograph had been the same elongated oval face with long thin nose and dark eyes a shade too near together which was looking down at her now she felt it would be churlish to refuse shelter so earnestly offered you are very kind she faltered i am sorry to be so troublesome i ought not to have come so far in such doubtful weather she went with him meekly walking her fastest under the pelting rain which was at her back now as they made for the house have you really come far he asked from trelasco i live at the angler's nest a cottage by the river you know it perhaps yes i know every house at trelasco then you are staying with mrs disney i presume i am mrs disney you with intense surprise i beg your pardon you are so young i imagine mrs disney an older person he glanced at the girlish figure the pale delicate face and told himself that his new acquaintance could scarcely be more than nineteen or twenty he had met major disney a man who looked about forty a lucky fellow to have caught such a pretty bird as this 
they had reached the shrubbery by this time and were hurrying along a winding walk where the rain reached them with less violence the narrow walk brought them on to a broad terrace in front of the house lostwithiel opened a half-glass door and led mrs disney into the library a long low room full of curious nooks and corners formed by two massive chimney-pieces and by the projecting wings of the heavy oak bookcases isla had never seen any room so filled with books nor had she ever seen a room with two such chimney-pieces of statuary marble yellowed with age elaborately carved with cherubic heads and cupids and torches and festal wreaths bows and arrows lyres and urns a wood fire was burning upon one hearth and it was hither lostwithiel brought his guest wheeling a large armchair in front of the blaze if you will take off your hat and jacket and sit down there i'll get my housekeeper to attend to you he said with his hand upon the bell you are more than kind i must hurry home directly the rain abates a little i have a careful old servant who is sure to be anxious about me said isola devouring the room with her eyes wanting to take in every detail of this enchanted castle she might never enter it again perhaps lord lostwithiel was so seldom there his absenteeism was the lament of the neighbourhood the things he ought to have done and did not do would have filled a book he had been wild in his youth he had once owned a theatre he had done or was supposed to have done things which were spoken of with bated breath but of late years he had developed new ambitions and had done with theatrical speculations he had become literary scientific political he was one of the lights of the intellectual world or of that small section of the intellectual world which is affiliated to the smart world he knew all the clever people in london and a good many of the intellectualities of paris berlin and vienna he had never married but it was supposed that he would eventually marry before he was forty for instance and that he would make a great match he was not rich but he was lord lostwithiel he was by no means handsome but he was said to be one of the most fascinating men in london isola pulled off her jacket slowly looking about her all the time and lostwithiel forbore from offering her any assistance lest he should intensify her evident shyness a man in plain clothes who looked more like a valet than a butler answered the bell send mrs mayne and bring tea ordered his lordship what a slender girlish form it was which the removal of the tweed jacket revealed the slim waist and somewhat narrow shoulders betokened a delicacy of constitution the throat was beautiful milk-white the throat of diana and the head now the hat was off would also have done for diana a small classic head with soft brown hair drawn smoothly away from the low white brow and rolled into a knot at the back the features were as delicate as the complexion in which there was no brilliancy of colouring only a paleness as of ivory the eyes were dark grey with long brown lashes and their present expression was between anxiety and wondering interest lostwithiel was not such a coxcomb as to appropriate that look of interest he saw that it was his house and not himself which inspired the feeling you like old houses i can see mrs disney he said smiling at her intensely they are histories in brick and stone are they not i dare say there are stories about this room innumerable stories i should have to ransack the record office for some of them and to draw upon a very bad memory to a perilous extent for others is it haunted i am not one of those privileged persons who see ghosts neither seventh son of a seventh son nor the mediumistic temperament but i have heard of an apparition pervading the house on occasions and being seen in this room which once formed part of a certain small monastery put down by henry the eighth and recorded in the black book as one of the oldest rooms it is naturally uncanny but as i have never suffered any inconvenience in that line i make it my den 
it is the most picturesque room i ever saw and what a multitude of books exclaimed isola yes i have a good many books i am always buying but i find i never have exactly the book i want and as i have no librarian i am too apt to forget the books i have if i could afford to spend more of my life at the mount i would engage some learned gentleman whose life had been a failure to take care of my books are you cornish like your husband mrs disney no i was born at Dinan what in that mediaeval breton city you are not french though i think my mother and father were both english but my sister and i were born and brought up in brittany lost with your question no further he had a shrewd idea that when english people live for a good many years in a breton town they have reasons of their own generally financial for their choice of a settlement he was a man who could not have spent six months of his life away from london or paris the housekeeper made her appearance and offered her services she wrung the rain out of isla's cloth skirt and wiped the muddy hem she took charge of the jacket and hat and at lostwithiel's suggestion she remained to pour out the tea she was a dignified person in a black silk gown and a lace cap and she treated her master as if he had been a demigod isla could not be afraid of taking tea in this matronly presence yet she kept looking nervously towards the window in front of her where the rain beat with undiminished force and where the night was closing in i see you are anxious to be on your way home mrs disney said lostwithiel who had nothing to do but watch her face such an expressive face at all times so picturesquely beautiful when touched by the flickering light of the wood fire if you were to wait for fine weather you might be here all night and your good people at home would be frantic i'll order a carriage and you can be at home in three-quarters of an hour oh no lord lostwithiel i couldn't give you so much trouble if your housekeeper will be so kind as to lend me a cloak and umbrella i can get home very well and i had better start at once in the rain alone and in the darkness it would be dark before you are home in any case no mrs disney if i would permit such a thing i should expect major disney to call me out directly he came home he is in india i think he is with regiment in burma do you expect him home soon not very soon not for six months or perhaps longer it was that which made me walk so far lostwithiel looked puzzled i mean that i was so disappointed by his letter a letter i received to-day that i went out for a long ramble to walk down my bad spirits and hardly knew how far i was going it has made me inflict trouble on you and mrs Maine. both mrs Maine and i are delighted to be of use to you order the station broom dalton immediately to the man who answered his bell the carriage can hardly be ready in less than twenty minutes so pray try to do justice to mrs Maine's tea it is delicious tea said isola enjoying the fire-glow and the dancing lights upon the richly bound books in all their varieties of colouring from black and crimson and orange tawny to vellum diapered with gold she was evidently relieved in her mind by the knowledge that she was to be driven home presently if you are really interested in this old house you must come some sunny morning and let mrs Maine show you over it said lostwithiel establishing himself with his cup and saucer upon the other side of the hearth she knows all the old stories and she has a better memory than i i should like so much to do so next summer when my husband can come with me i'm afraid major disney won't care much about the old place he is a native of these parts and must have been here often in my father's time i shall hope to receive you both if i am here next october for the shooting but there is no need to postpone your inspection of the house to the remote future come on the first fine morning that you have nothing better to do mrs Maine is always at home and i am almost always out of doors in the morning you can have the house to yourselves and talk about ghosts to your heart's content 
oh my lord i hope i know better than to say anything disrespectful of the house protested mrs mayne my dear mayne a family ghost is as respectable an institution as a family tree isola murmured some vague acknowledgment of his civility she was far too shy to have any idea of taking advantage of his offer to re-enter that house alone of her own accord would be impossible by and by with her husband at her side she would be bold enough to do anything to accept any hospitality that lostwithiel might be moved to offer he would invite martin perhaps for the shooting or to a luncheon or a dinner she wondered vaguely if she would ever possess a gown good enough to wear at a dinner-party in such a house after this there came a brief silence mrs mayne stood straight and prim behind the tea-table nothing would have induced her to sit in his lordship's presence albeit she had dandled him in her arms when there was much less of him than of the cambric and fine flannel which composed his raiment and albeit his easy familiarity might have invited some forgetfulness of class distinctions mrs mayne fully understood that she was wanted there to set the stranger at her ease and she performed her mission but even her presence could not lessen isola's shyness she felt like a bird caught in a net or fluttering in the grasp of some strong but kindly hand she sat listening for carriage wheels and only hearing the dull thumping of her own scared heart and yet he was so kind and yet he so fully realized her idea of high-bred gentleness that she need hardly have been so troubled by the situation she stole a glance at him as he stood by the chimney-piece in a thoughtful attitude looking down at the burning logs on the massive old andirons the firelight shining on a face above it will often give a sinister look to the openest countenance and to-night lost with his long narrow face dark deep-set eyes and pointed beard had some touch of the diabolical in that red and uncertain glow an effect that was but instantaneous for as the light changed the look passed and she saw him as he really was with his pale and somewhat sunken cheeks and eyes darkly grave of exceeding gentleness have you lived long at the angler's nest mrs disney he asked nearly a year and a half ever since my marriage with just one interval on the continent before martin went to india then i need not ask if you are heartily sick of the place indeed i should not be tired of the cottage or the neighbourhood if my husband were at home i am only tired of solitude he wants me to send for his sister a girl who has not long left school to keep me company but i detest schoolgirls, and i would much rather be alone than put up with a silly companion you are wise beyond your years mrs disney avoid the sister by all means she would bore you to death a scampering exuberant girl who would develop hysteria after one month of cornish dullness besides i am sure you have resources of your own and that you would rather endure solitude than uncongenial company isola sighed and shook her head rather dolefully tracing the pattern of the persian rug with the point of her stick i am very fond of books and of music she said but one gets tired of being alone after a time it seems such ages since martin and i said good-bye in venice i was dreadfully unhappy at first i stand almost alone in the world when i am parted from him your father and mother are dead in gentlest inquiry oh no they are not dead they are at dinan she said almost as if it were the same thing and that is very far from trelasco they never leave dinan the kind of life suits them mamma knits papa has his club and his english newspapers people enjoy the english papers so much more when they live abroad than when they are at home mamma is a very bad sailor it would be a risk for her to cross if my sister or i were dangerously ill mamma would come but it would be at the hazard of her life papa has often told me so he is rather worse than mamma then i conclude you were married at dinan oh yes i never left Brittany until my wedding-day what a pretty idea it is as if major disney had found a new kind of wild flower 
in some cranny of the old grey wall that guards the town you know dinan there are very few places within easy reach of a yachtsman that i don't know i have anchored in almost every bay between cherbourg and brest and have rambled inland whenever there was anything worth seeing within a day's journey from the coast yes i know dinan well strange to think that i may have passed you in the street there do you sketch by the way a little ah then perhaps you are one of the young ladies i have seen sitting at street corners or under archways doing fearful and wonderful things with a box of moist colours and a drawing-board the young ladies who sit about the streets are tourists said isola with a look of disgust i understand the resident ladies would no more do such things than they would sit upon the pavement and make pictures of salmon or men of war in coloured chalks like our metropolitan artists i think i hear a carriage said isola putting down her cup and saucer and looking at her jacket which mrs mayne was holding before the fire yes that is the carriage answered lostwithiel opening the glass door what a night the rain is just as bad as it was when i brought you indoors if you will accept the use of a shawl ma'am it would be safer than putting on this damp jacket yes mayne get your shawl mrs disney will wear it i know the housekeeper bustled out and lostwithiel and his guest were alone looking at each other somewhat helplessly as they stood far apart she in the glow of the hearth he in the darkness near the door and feeling that every available subject of conversation had been exhausted their embarrassment was increased when dalton and a footman came in with two great lamps and flooded the room with light i hardly know how to thank you for having taken so much trouble about me isla faltered presently under that necessity to say something which is one of the marks of shyness there has been no trouble i only hope i got you out of that pelting rain in time to save you from any evil consequences strange that our acquaintance should begin in such an accidental manner i shall be glad to know more of major disney when he comes home and in the meantime i hope i shall have the pleasure of meeting you sometimes no doubt you know everybody in the neighbourhood so we can hardly help running against each other somewhere isola smiled faintly thinking that the chances of any such meeting were of the slightest but she did not gainsay him he wanted to say something courteous no doubt and had gone into no nice question of probabilities before he spoke she had heard him described by a good many people who had hinted darkly at his shortcomings but had all agreed as to his politeness and persuasive powers a man who would talk over satan himself said the village lawyer mrs mayne reappeared with a comfortable scotch plaid which she wrapped carefully about mrs disney in a pleasant motherly fashion the rain had all been shaken off the little felt hat which had no feathers or frippery to spoil people who live in the west of england make their account with wet weather lord lostwithiel handed his guest into the carriage and stood bareheaded in the rain to wish her good-bye before he shut the door i shall be very anxious to know that you have escaped cold he said at the last moment i hope you won't think me a nuisance if i call to-morrow to inquire he shut the door quickly and the broom drove off before she could answer she was alone in the darkness in the snug warm little carriage there was a clock ticking beside her a sound that startled her in the stillness there was a basket hanging in front of her and an odour of cigars and russia leather there was a black bear rug lined with white fleeciness which almost filled the carriage she had never sat in such a carriage how different from the mouldy old broom in which she occasionally went to dinner parties a capacious vehicle with a bow window like a seaside parlour she leant back in a corner of the little carriage wrapped in the soft warm rug wondering at her strange adventure she had penetrated that mysterious house on black fir hill and she had made the acquaintance of lord lostwithiel how much she would have to tell martin in her next letter she wrote to him every week a long loving letter closely written on thin paper pouring out all her fancies and feelings to the husband she loved with all her heart she sighed as her thoughts recurred to the letter 
received to-day six months or perhaps even a year before he was to come back to her yet the letter had not been without hopefulness he had the prospect of getting his next step before that year was over and then his coming home would be a final return he would be able to retire and he would buy some land a hundred acres or so and breed horses one of his youthful dreams and do a little building perhaps to enlarge and beautify the angler's nest and his isla should have a pair of ponies and a good saddle-horse he looked forward to a life of unalloyed happiness End of chapter one chapter two of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter two but the days drop one by one next morning was fine a morning so bright and balmy that the month might have been mistaken for september isola ran down to the garden in her neat little morning frock and linen collar and ran about among the shrubs and autumn flowers in a much gayer mood than that of yesterday she loved her garden small and modest as it was in comparison with the grounds and gardens of her county neighbours and on a morning like this it was rapture to her to run from flower to flower and from shrub to shrub with her great garden scissors in her hand and her garden basket hanging over her arm clipping a withered leaf or a fading flower every here and there or plucking up those little ground soul plants which seem the perpetual expression of the earth's fertility alas those pale tea-roses those sulphur and flame-coloured dahlias meant the last crumbs of summer's plenteous feast soon winter and barrenness would spread over the poor little garden but even in the chill dark heart of midwinter those graceful conifers and shining laurels the vermilion on the holly bushes the crimson of the hawthorn berries would give beauty to the scene and then would come the return of persephone with her hands full of gold the abundant gold of crocus and daffodil jonquil and pale primrose the rain of yellow blossoms which heralds the spring half a year did not seem such an appalling interval nay even the thought of a year of waiting did not scare her so much this morning in the sunlight and fresh clear air as yesterday in the grey dim rain what an improvement martin would find in the garden should he return before the end of the summer how tall those irish yews had grown by the gate yonder a pair of dark green obelisks keeping stately guard over the modest wooden gate and the escalonia hedge that screened the kitchen garden was two feet higher since the spring how the juniper at the corner of the grass plot had shot up and thickened arbutus laurel ribes everything had been growing as shrubs only grow in the south and southwest of england what a darling garden it was and how full of pleasure her life would be by and by when martin was able to settle down and buy land and give her a little herd of jersey cows she had always envied the farmers wives in that fertile valley of the Rance where her childhood had passed and how delightful to have her own cows and her own farmyard and a pony carriage to drive up and down the hilly cornish lanes and into the narrow little street of fowey and to ride her own horse by her husband's side for long exploring rambles among those wild hills towards mevagisi she had only to wait patiently for a year or less and that bright life might be hers she had no frivolous vanities no craving for dissipations and fine clothes no fatal thirst for smartness her ideas were essentially modest 
she had never envied her sister who had married a rich stockbroker and whose brand-new red-brick house in hans place towered above surrounding chelsea as much as her diamonds eclipsed the jewels of other middle-class matrons at the festal gatherings of south kensington and bayswater gwendolen had married for wealth isola had married for love she had given her girlish affection to a man who was nearly thirty years her senior her heart going out to him almost at the beginning of their acquaintance first because he was a soldier and in her mind a hero and secondly because he was kinder to her than anybody else had ever been he was her first admirer that delicate loveliness as of some woodland flower which distinguished isola from the herd of women had been still in embryo when major disney spent a summer holiday between dinard and Dinan. she had scarcely ranked as a pretty girl two years ago the slight figure was denounced as scraggy the pale face was voted sickly and the delicate features were spoken of as insignificant gwendolen's big fair face with its healthy roses and lilies her bright hair and well-developed figure had completely overshadowed the younger sister martin disney was the first man upon whom isola's low-toned beauty had any power he was drawn to her from the very beginning she listened so prettily with such a bewitching modesty and almost tremulous pleasure when he talked to her as they sat side by side on the club ground at dinard watching gwendolen playing tennis superb in striped flannel of delicate pink and cream colour he could hardly believe that those two were sisters isola was so slim and fragile of such an ethereal prettiness owing so little to colouring and nothing to redundancy of form he was told that miss manwaring was engaged to one of the richest men in london that of course was a gossip's fable but it was an established fact that mr hazelrig had made his fortune in south american railways waterworks and other public improvements and could afford to make a liberal settlement he showed no indisposition to be generous to his handsome sweetheart he settled seven hundred a year upon her and told her that she could spend as much of that income as she liked upon toilet and pocket-money and that he would invest her surplus advantageously for her the two sisters were married on the same day to husbands who were their seniors by more than twenty years in one instance by thirty years in the other daniel hazelrig had passed his jubilee birthday when he led miss manwaring to the altar but he was a fine-looking man straight and tall like his bride with a ruddy complexion an iron-grey moustache and an air and bearing that savoured rather of the mess-room than the city he had been on the stock exchange ever since he came of age but he had made it the study of his life not to look city or to talk city nothing could tempt him to expatiate upon the money market outside his office he would talk sport travel politics even literature of which he knew very little but not stocks and shares nicaraguas or reading and philadelphias mexican street railways or patagonian building society isola read her sister's glowing descriptions of dinners and routs gowns by worth or cresser suppers for two hundred people at a guinea a head from gunter wagon loads of cut roses from cheshunt or cheam and felt no thrill of longing no pang of envy life in the angler's nests might be dull but it was only dull because martin was away she would have felt more solitary in hans place had she accepted gwendolen's invitation to spend her christmas there than she would feel in the cottage by the river even with no better company than tabitha shaw and tim she was essentially shy and retiring her girlhood had been spent in a very narrow world among people whom she seemed to have known all her life for while gwendolen who was six years older had been out for four years before she married 
joined in all the little gaieties of the place and was always making new acquaintance isola who was not out spent her days for the most part in a half-neglected garden on the slope of the hill that looks across the rance towards the unseen sea the view from that garden was one of the finest in western france and it was isola's delight to sit in a little berceau at the end of a terrace walk with her books and work-basket and drawing-board all through the long tranquil summer day in a silence broken by the sound of wheels and horses feet on the viaduct and bridge two or three hundred feet below or by the muffled music of the organ in the convent chapel tim the fox terrier and shah the persian cat were both on the lawn with their mistress this morning they were not friendly towards each other but preserved an armed neutrality tim chased every stray strange cat with a fury that threatened annihilation and he always looked as if he would like to give chase to shah when that dignified piece of fluff moved slowly across the lawn before him with uplifted tail that seemed to wave defiance but he knew that any attack upon that valued personage would entail punishment and disgrace isola loved both these animals the cat a wedding present from an old breton lady in denan the terrier her husband's parting legacy take care of tim he had said the day they parted on board the steamer at venice the dog loved his mistress vehemently and obtrusively leaping into her lap at the slightest sign of indulgence in her eye the cat suffered himself to be adored receiving all attentions with a sleepy complacency it was only half-past eight and the world was looking its freshest there was an opening in the shrubbery that let in a view of the river and just in front of this opening there was a rustic bench on which major disney liked to smoke his after-breakfast pipe or after dinner cigar the garden contained very little over two acres but it was an old garden and there were some fine old trees which must have shaded hoops and powder and pigtails and knee-breeches major disney had done a great deal in the way of planting wherever there was room for improvement and he had secured to himself an elderly gardener of exceptionable industry who worked in the garden as if he loved it tabitha again was one of those wonderful women who know all about everything except books and she too loved the garden and helped at weeding and watering in seasons of pressure thus it had come to pass that these two acres of velvet lawn and flower-bed shrubbery and trim old-fashioned garden had acquired a reputation in trelasco and people frequently complimented mrs disney about her garden she was proud of their praises remembering the straggling rose-bushes and lavender and unkempt flower-beds and overgrown cabbages and loose shingly paths in that old garden at denan which she had loved despite its neglected condition her house at trelasco was just as superior to the house at denan as garden was to garden she often thought of her old home the shabby square house with walls and shutters of dazzling white shining brown floors and worn-out furniture of the empire period furniture which had been shabby and out of repair when colonel manwaring took the house furnished intending to spend a month or two in retirement at denan with his wife and her firstborn a chubby little girl of five they had lost a promising boy of a year old and the colonel having no reason for living anywhere in particular and very little to live upon thought that residence in a foreign country would improve his wife's health and spirits he had been told that denan was picturesque and cheap and he had put himself and his family on board the st malo steamer and had gone out like an emigrant to push his fortunes in a strange land he had even an idea that he might get something to do in denan a secretaryship of a club an agency or managerial post of some kind never having cultivated the art of self-examination so far as to discover that he must have proved utterly incapable had any such occasion presented itself 
the occasion never did present itself the one english club existent at denan in those days was amply provided with the secretarial element there was nothing in denan for an englishman to manage no english agency required colonel manwaring settled down into a kind of somnolent submission to obscure fortunes he liked the old town and he liked the climate he liked the cooking and he liked being out of the way of all the people he knew and whose vicinity would have obliged him to live up to a certain conventional level he liked to get his english newspapers upon french soil and it irked him not that they were thirty-six hours old he liked to bask in the sunshine on the terrace above the ranz or in the open places of the town he liked talking of the possibilities of an impending war in very dubious french with the french officers whose acquaintance he made at club or caf he had sold his commission and sunk the proceeds of the sale upon an annuity he had a little income of his own and his wife had a little money from a maiden aunt and these resources just enabled him to live with a certain unpretending comfort he had a good breton cook and an old scotch valet and butler who would have gone through fire and water for his master mrs manwaring was a thoroughly negative character placid as summer seas sympathetic and helpless she let macgregor and antoinette manage the house for her do all the catering pay all the bills and work the whole machinery of her domestic life she rejoiced in having a good-tempered husband and obedient daughters she had no boys to put her in a fever of anxiety lest they should be making surreptitious ascents in balloons or staking their little all upon zero at the establishment at dinar in summer she sat all day in one particular south window knitting stockings for the colonel and reading the english papers in winter she occupied herself in the same manner by the chimney corner she devoted one day in the week to writing long letters to distant relatives once a day weather permitting she took a gentle constitutional walk upon the terrace above the ranz with one of her daughters needless to say that in this life of harmless apathy she had grown very stout and that she had forgotten almost every accomplishment of her childhood from the placid monotony of life in brittany to the placid monotony of life in cornwall was not a startling transition yet when she married martin disney and bade her commonplace father and her apathetic mother good-bye isola felt as if she had escaped from stagnation into a fresh and vigorous atmosphere disney's character made all the difference he was every inch a soldier a keen politician a man who had seen many countries and read many books clear-brained strong-willed energetic self-reliant she felt what it was to belong to somebody who was capable of taking care of her she trusted him implicitly and she loved him with as deep a love as a girl of nineteen is capable of feeling for any lover it may be that the capacity for deep feeling is but half developed at that age and in that one fact may be found the key to many domestic mysteries mysteries of unions which begin in the gladness and warmth of responsive affection and which a few years later pass into a frozen region of indifference or are wrecked on sunken rocks of guilty passion certain it was that isola manwaring gave her hand to this grave middle-aged soldier in all the innocence of a first love and the love with which he rewarded her confidence the earnest watchful love of a man of mature years was enough for her happiness that honeymoon time that summer of installation in the cornish cottage and then the leisurely journey to venice in the waning brilliance of a southern october seemed like one long happy dream as she looked back upon it now after a year of solitude 
the doctor had decided that in the delicate health in which she found herself at the end of that summer it would be dangerous for her to accompany her husband to india more especially as a campaign in burma meant roughing it and she would in all probability have been separated from him in the east so they bade each other a sad good-bye at venice and isola travelled quickly homeward all possible comfort having been secured for her on the way by her husband's forethought it had been a long sad sleepy journey through a rain-blurred landscape and she was glad when the evening of the fourth day brought her to the snug little dining-room in the angler's nest where tabitha was waiting for her with a cheerful fire and the amber shaded reading-lamp and the most delightful little composite meal of chicken and tongue and tart and cream and tea it was pleasant to be among familiar things after that long journey in stuffy ladies carriages with elderly invalids whose chief talk was of their ailments pleasant to see the shah's solemn sea-green eyes staring at her and to have to repulse the demonstrative attentions of tim who leaped upon her lap and licked her face vehemently every time he caught her off her guard she was ill and broken down after her journey and that sad parting and she hid her tears upon tabitha's comfortable arm it will be at least a year before he comes back she sobbed how can i live without him all that dreary time tabitha thought it was very hard upon the girl wife but affected to make light of it lor bless you ma'am she said a year looks a long time but it isn't much when you come to grapple with it there'll be such a lot for you to do there'll be the garden we ought to make ever so many improvements next spring and summer against the master comes home and there's your piano you want to improve yourself i've heard you say so and you can get up all sorts of new tunes and won't the major be pleased with you and then there'll be something else to occupy your mind before next summer comes that something else which was to have filled isola's empty life with a new interest ended in disappointment she was very ill at the beginning of the new year and tabitha nursed her with motherly tenderness long after the doctor and the professional nurse had renounced their care of her she regained strength very slowly after that serious illness and it was only in june that she was able to take the lonely rambles she loved or row in her little boat upon the river tabitha was a servant in a thousand faithful and devoted clever active and industrious she had been made to martin disney's mother for nearly fifteen years had nursed her mistress through a long and weary illness and had closed her eyes in death martin parted with that faithful servant with reluctance after the breaking up of his mother's household and he told her if he should marry and have a house of his own a very remote contingency she must be his housekeeper love and marriage came upon him before the end of the year as a delightful surprise he bought the angler's nest and he engaged tabitha for the rest of her life at wages which beginning at a liberal figure were to rise a pound every christmas as if i cared about wages mr martin exclaimed tabitha i'd just as soon come to you for nothing i've got more clothes than will last my time i'll be bound you'd only have to find me in shoe leather she had never got out of the way of calling her master by the name by which she had first known him when his father and elder brother were both at home in the old family house at fowey in all moments of forgetfulness he was still mr martin and now in this bright november morning tabitha came out to say that breakfast was waiting for her young mistress and mistress and maid went in together to the cosy dining-room where the small round table near the window was arranged as only tabitha could arrange a table with autumn flowers and spotless damask and a new-laid egg and a dish of honey and some dainty little rolls of tabitha's own making nestling in a napkin a breakfast for a princess in a fairy tale 
there was only one other servant in the little household a bouncy rosy-cheeked cornish girl who was very industrious under tabitha's eye and very idle when she was out of that faithful housekeeper's ken tabitha cooked and took care of everything and for the most part waited upon her mistress in this time of widowhood although susan was supposed to be parlour-maid tabitha poured out the tea and buttered a roll while isola leant back in the bamboo chair and played with the shawl i never knew him do such a thing before said tabitha in continuation of a theme which had been fully discussed last night oh it was very kind and polite but it was not such a tremendous thing after all answered isola still occupied with the persian he could hardly stand by and see one drowned you have no idea what the rain was like but to send you home in his own carriage there was nothing else for him to do except send me home in the gardener's cart he could not have turned out a dog in such weather it's a thing that never happened before and it just shows what a respect he must have for the disneys you don't know how standoffish he is with all the people about here how he keeps himself to himself not a bit like his father and mother they used to entertain all the neighbourhood and they went everywhere as affable as you like he has taken care to show people that he doesn't want their company they say he has led a very queer kind of life at home and abroad never settling down anywhere here to-day and gone to-morrow roving about with his yacht i don't believe any good ever comes of a young gentleman like that having a yacht it would be ever so much better for him to live at the mount and keep a pack of harriers why should a yacht be bad asked isola lazily beginning her breakfast tabitha standing by the table all the time ready for conversation oh i don't know it gives a young man too much liberty answered tabitha shaking her head with a meaning air as if with a knowledge of dark things in connection with yachts he can keep just what company he likes on board gentlemen or ladies he can gamble or drink as much as he likes there's nobody to check him sundays and weekdays night and day are all alike to him lord lostwithiel is not particularly young said isola musingly not paying much attention to this homily on yachts he must be thirty i think thirty-two last birthday he ought to marry and settle down they say he's very clever and that he's bound to make a figure in politics some of these odd days isola looked at the clock on the chimney-piece a gilt horseshoe with onyx nails one of her wedding presents it was early yet only half past nine lord lostwithiel had talked about calling to inquire after her health she felt overpowered with shyness at the thought of seeing him again alone with no stately mrs mayne to take the edge off a tete a tete anything to escape such an ordeal there was her boat that boat of which she was perfect mistress and in which she went for long dawdling expeditions towards fowry or lost withiel with only tim for her companion tim who was the best of company in almost perpetual circulation between stem and stern balancing himself in perilous places every now and then to bark furiously at imaginary foes in slowly passing fishermen's boats have you any fancy about lunch ma'am asked tabitha lingering with feather-brush in hand over a side-table on which work-basket books writing-case and flower-vases were arranged with tasteful neatness by those skilful hands no you dear old tabby you know that anything will do for me bread and jam if you like and some of your clotted cream won't it be nice when we have our very own dairy and our very own cows who will know us and be fond of us like tim and the shaw she put on her hat and jacket and went out into the garden again singing la lettre de perichot as she went it was a capital idea to take refuge in her boat if his lordship should call which was doubtful since he might be one of that numerous race of people whose days are made up of unfulfilled intentions and promises never realized if he should call she would be far away when he came 
he would make his inquiry leave his card which would look nice in the old indian bowl on the hall table such cards have a power of flotation unknown to other pasteboard they are always at the top isola went to the little boat-house on the edge of the lawn tim following her she pushed the light skiff down the slope into the water and in a few minutes more her sculls were in the rowlocks and she was moving slowly up the river between autumnal woods in a silence broken only by the dip of the sculls and the little rippling sound as the water dropped away from them a good deal of her life was spent like this moving slowly up the river through that deep silence of the woodland shores the river was as beautiful as the dart almost but lonelier and more silent it was martin disney's river the river whose ripples had soothed his mother's dying ears the last of all earthly sounds that had been heard in the stillness of the death chamber in that tranquil atmosphere isola used to dream of her absent husband and of that mystical world of the east which seemed made up of dreams the world of brahma and buddha of jewel-bedecked rajas and palace tombs world of beauty and of terror of tropical forests tigers orchids serpents elephants thugs she dreamt her dream of that strange world in fear and trembling conjuring up scenes of horror tiger hunts snakes hidden in the corner of a tent battle fever fire mutiny her morbid imagination pictured all possible and impossible danger for the man she loved and then she thought of his home-coming for good for good for all the span of their joint lives and she longed for that return with the sickness of hope deferred she would go back to the angler's nest sometimes after one of these dreamy days upon the river and would pace about the house or the garden planning things for her husband's return as if he were due next day she would wheel his own particular chair to the drawing-room fireplace and look at it and arrange the fall of the curtains before the old-fashioned bow-window and change the position of the lamp and alter the books on the shelves and do this and that with an eye to effect anxious to discover how the room might be made prettiest coziest most lovable and homelike for him for him for him and now she had to resign herself to a year's delay perhaps yes he had said it might be a year all that bright picture of union and content which had seemed so vivid and so near had now grown dim and pale it had melted into a shadowy distance to a girl who has but just passed her twentieth birthday a year of waiting and delay seems an eternity i won't think of him she said to herself plunging her skulls fiercely into the rippling water the tide was running down and it was strong enough to have carried her little boat out to sea like an autumn leaf swept along the current i must try to lull my mind to sleep as if i were an enchanted princess and so bridge over twelve slow months of loneliness i won't think of you martin my good brave truest of the true i'll occupy my poor foolish little mind i'll write a novel perhaps like old miss carver at dinan anything in the world just to keep my thoughts from always brooding on one subject she rode on steadily hugging the shore under the wooded hillside where the rich autumn colouring and the clear cool lights were so full of beauty a beauty which she could feel with a vague dim sense which just touched the realm of poetry perhaps she felt the same sense of loss which keats or alfred de musset would have felt in the stillness of such a scene the want of something to people the wood and the river some race of beings loftier than fishermen and peasants some of those mystic forms which the poet sees amidst the shadows of old woods or in the creeks and sheltered inlets of a secluded river she thought with a half smile of yesterday's adventure what importance that foolish tabitha gave to so simple an incident the merest commonplace courtesy necessitated by circumstances and only because the person who had been commonly courteous was richard halbert thirteenth baron lost with ill thirteenth 
fifteenth baron there lay the distinction these cornish folks worshipped antique lineage tabitha would have thought very little of a mushroom peer's civility although he had sent her mistress home in a chariot and four she was no worshipper of wealth and she turned up her blunt old nose at mr crowther of glenaveril the great new red brick mansion which had sprung up like a fungus amidst the woods only yesterday because he had made his money in trade albeit his trade had been upon a large scale and altogether genteel and worthy to be esteemed a great cloth factory at stroud which was said to have clad half the army at one period of modern history poor foolish tabitha what would she have thought of the tea drinking in that lovely old room mysteriously beautiful in the light of a wood fire the playful uncertain light which glorifies everything what would she have thought of those walls of books richly bound books books in sombre brown big books and little books from floor to ceiling a room which made those poor little oak bookcases in the cottage parlour something to blush for what would tabitha have thought of his deferential kindness that tone of deepest consideration with which such men treat all women even the old and uncomely she could hardly have helped admiring his good manners whatever dark things she might have been told about his earlier years why should he not have a yacht it seemed the fittest life for a man without home ties a man still young and with no need to labour at a profession what better life could there be than that free wandering from port to port over a romantic sea and to isola all seas were alike mysterious and romantic she dawdled away the morning she sculled against the stream for nearly three hours and then let her boat drift down the river to the garden above the tow-path it was long past her usual time for luncheon when she moored her boat to the little wooden steps leaving it for thomas the gardener to pull up into the boat-house she had made up her mind that if lost with ill troubled himself to make any inquiry about her health he would call in the morning she had guessed rightly tabitha was full of his visit and his wondrous condescension he had called at eleven o'clock on his way to the railway station at fowey he called in the most perfect of tea-carts with a pair of bright bays tabitha had opened the door to him he had asked quite anxiously about mrs disney's health he had walked round the garden with tabitha and admired everything and had told her that major disney had a better gardener than any he had at the mount after which he had left her charmed by his amiability and so this little episode in isla's life came to a pleasant end leaving no record but his lordship's card lying like a jewel on the top of less distinguished names in the old indian bowl End of chapter 2chapter three of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter three o oh, moment one and infinite isola fancied that her adventure was all over and done with after that ceremonious call of inquiry but in so narrow a world as that of trelasco it was scarcely possible to have seen the last of a man who lived within three miles and she and lord lostwithiel met now and then in the course of her solitary rambles the walk into fowey following the old disused railway was almost her favourite and one which she had occasion to take oftener than any other since tabitha was a stay-at-home person and expected her young mistress to do all the marketing so that isola had usually some errand to take her into the narrow street on the hillside above the sea it was at fowey that she oftenest met lost withiel his yacht the vendetta 
was in the harbour under repairs and he went down to look at the work daily and often dawdled upon the deck till dusk watching the carpenters or talking to his captain they had been half over the world together master and man and were almost as familiar as brothers the crew were half english and half foreign and it was a curious mixture of languages in which lost withiel talked to them they were most of them old hands on board the vendetta and would have stood by the owner of the craft if he had wanted to sail her up the phlegathon she was a schooner of two hundred and fifty tons built for speed and with a rakish rig she had cost with her fittings her extra silk sails for racing more money than lost withiel cared to remember but he loved her as a man loves his mistress and if she were costly and exacting she was no worse than other mistresses and she was true as steel which they are not always and so he felt that he had money's worth in her he showed her to isola one evening from the promontory above the harbour where she met him in the autumn sundown her work at the butcher's and the grocer's being done she had gone up to that airy height by point neptune to refresh herself with a long look seaward before she went back to her home in the valley lost with you took her away from the point and made her look down into the harbour isn't she a beauty he asked pointing below her inexperienced eyes roamed about among the boats colliers fishing boats half a dozen yachts of different tonnage which is yours she asked which why there is only one decent boat in the harbour the schooner she saw which boat he meant by the direction in which he flourished his walking stick but was not learned in distinctions of rig the vendetta being under repair did not seem to her especially lovely have you pretty cabins she asked childishly oh yes they're pretty enough but that's not the question look at her lines she skims over the water like a gull ladies seem to think only what a boat looks like inside i believe my boat is rather exceptional from a lady's point of view will you come on board and have a look at her thanks no i couldn't possibly it will be dark before i get home as it is but it wouldn't take you a quarter of an hour and we could row you up the river in no time ever so much faster than you could walk isola looked frightened at the very idea not for the world she said tabitha would think i had gone mad she would begin to fancy that i could never go out without overstaying the daylight and troubling you to send me home ah but it is so long since you were last belated he said in his low caressing voice with a tone that was new to her and different from all other voices ages and ages ago half a lifetime there could be no harm in being just a little late this mild evening and i would row you home myself under the new moon look at her swinging up in the grey blue there above paul Rowan. she looks like a fairy boat anchored in the sky by that star hanging a fathom below her keel i look at her and wish 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 he looked up pale in the twilight with dark deep-set eyes of which it was never easy to read the expression perhaps that inscrutable look made those sunken and by no means brilliant eyes more interesting than some much handsomer eyes interesting with the deep interest that belongs to the unknowable good-night said isola i am afraid that i shall be very late good-night you would be earlier if you would trust to the boat he held out his hand and she gave him hers hesitatingly for the first time in their acquaintance it was after this parting in the wintry sundown that she first began to look troubled at meeting him the troubled feeling grew upon her somehow in a life so lonely and uneventful trifles assume undue importance she tried to avoid him and on her journeys to fowey she finished her business in the village street and turned homewards without having climbed the promontory by that rugged walk she loved so well it needed some self-denial to forego that keen pleasure of standing on the windy height and gazing across the western sea towards ushant and her native province 
but she knew that lord lostwithiel spent a good deal of his time lounging on the heights above the harbour and she did not want to meet him again although she lived her quiet life in the shortening days for nearly a month without meeting him she was not allowed to forget his existence wherever she went people talked about him and speculated about him every detail of his existence made matter for discussion his yacht his political opinions his talents his income his matrimonial prospects the likelihood or unlikelihood of his settling down permanently at the mount and taking the hounds which were probably to be without a master within a measurable distance of time there was so little to talk about in trelasco and those scattered hamlets between fowey and lost withiel isola found herself joining in the talk at afternoon tea-parties those casual droppings in of charitable ladies who had been their rounds among the cottagers and came back to the atmosphere of gentility worn out by long stories of woes and ailments sore legs and rheumatic joints and were very glad to discuss a local nobleman over a cup of delicately flavoured indian tea in the glow of a flower-scented drawing-room among other houses mrs disney visited glenaveril mr crowther's great red brick mansion with its pepper-box turrets and jacobean windows after the manner of burley house by stamford town here lived in wealth and state quite the most important family within a mile of trelasco the van sittart crowthers erst of pilbury mills near stroud now as much county as a family can make itself after its head had passed his fortieth birthday nobody quite knew how mr crowther had come to be a van sittart unless by the easy process of baptism and the complacence of an aristocratic sponsor but the crowthers had been known in stroud for nearly two hundred years and had kept their sacks upright as mr crowther called it all that time fortune had favoured this last of the crowthers and at forty years of age he had found himself rich enough to dispose of his business to two younger brothers and a brother-in-law and to convert himself into a landed proprietor he bought up all the land that was to be had about trelasco cornish people cling to their land like limpets to a rock and it was not easy to acquire the ownership of the soil in the prosperous past when land was paying nearly four per cent in other parts of england cornishmen were content to hold estates that yielded only two per cent but the days of decay had come when mr crowther entered the market and he was able to buy out more than one gentleman of ancient lineage when he had secured his land he sent to plymouth for an architect and he so harried that architect and so tampered with his drawings that the result of much labour and outlay was that monstrosity in red brick with stone dressings known in the neighbourhood as glenaveril mr crowther's elder daughter was deep in lord lytton's newly published poem when the house was being finished and had imposed that euphonious name upon her father glenaveril the house really was in a glen or at least in a wooded valley and glenaveril seemed to suit it to perfection and so the romantic name of a romantic poem was cut in massive gothic letters on the granite pillars of gansetart crowther's gate beneath a shield which exhibited the coat of arms made and provided by the herald's college mrs van sittart crowther was at home on thursday afternoons when the choicest indian tea and the thickest cream coffee as in paris and the daintiest cakes and muffins which a professed cook could provide furnished the zest to conversation for it could scarcely be said that the conversation gave a zest to those creature comforts it would be perhaps nearer the mark to say that mrs crowther was supposed to sit in the drawing-room on these occasions while the two miss crowthers were at home the mistress of glenaveril was not an aspiring woman and in her heart of hearts she preferred gloucestershire to cornwall and the stuccoed villa on the cheltenham road with its acre and a half of tennis lawn and flower-beds open to the blazing sun and powdered 
with the summer dust to glenaveril with its solemn belt of woodlands and its too spacious grandeur she was not vulgar or illiterate she never misplaced an aspirate she had learnt to play the piano and to talk french at the politest of young ladies schools at cheltenham she never dressed outrageously or behaved rudely she had neither red hands nor splay feet she was in all things blameless and yet belinda and alicia her daughters were ashamed of her and did their utmost to keep her and her tastes and her opinions in the background she had no style she was not smart she seemed incapable of grasping the ideas or understanding the ways of smart people or at least her daughters thought so your mother is one of the best women i know said the curate to alicia being on the most confidential terms with both sisters and yet you and miss crowther are always trying to edit her father wants a great deal more editing than mother said belinda but there's no use in talking to him he is encased in the armour of self-esteem it made my blood run cold to see him taking lord lostwithiel over the grounds and stables the other day praising everything and pointing out this and that and even saying how much things had cost i dare say it was vulgar agreed the curate but it's human nature i've seen a duke behave in pretty much the same way children are always proud of their new toys and men are but children of a larger growth don't you know you'll find there's a family resemblance in humanity and that nature is stronger than training lord lostwithiel would never behave in that kind of way boring people about his stables lord lostwithiel doesn't care about stables he would bore you about his yacht i dare say no he never talks of himself or his own affairs that is just the charm of his manner he makes us all believe that he is thinking about us and yet i dare say he forgets us directly he is outside the gate i am sure he does replied mr colfox the curate there isn't a more selfish man living than lost withiel the fair belinda looked at him angrily there are assertions which young ladies make on purpose to have them controverted mrs disney hated the great red brick porch with its vaulted roof and monstrous iron lantern and the bell which made such a clamour as if it meant fire or at least dinner when she touched the hanging brass handle she hated to find herself face to face with a tall footman who hardly condescended to say whether his mistress were at home or not but just preceded her languidly along the broad corridor where the carpet was so thick that it felt like turf and flung open the drawing-room door with an air and pronounced her name into empty space so remote were the half-dozen ladies at the other end of the room clustered round belinda's tea-table and fed with cake by alicia while mrs crowther sat in the window a little way off with her basket of wool-work at her side and her fat somnolent pug lying at her feet to isola it was an ordeal to have to walk the length of the drawing-room navigating her course amidst an archipelago of expensive things florentine tables portfolios of engravings louis says jardiniere easels supporting the last expensive etching from goupils to the window where mrs crowther waited to receive her rising with her lap full of wolves to shake hands with simple friendliness and without a vestige of style belinda shook hands on a level with the tip of her sharp retroussé nose and twirled the silken train of her tea-gown with the serpentine grace of sarah bernhardt she prided herself on those serpentine movements and languid graces which belong to the graeco belgravian period while alicia held herself like a ramrod and took her stand upon being nothing if not sporting her olive cloth gown and starched collar her neat double-soled boots and cloth gaiters were a standing reproach to belinda's silken slovenliness and embroidered slippers always dropping off her restless feet and being chased surreptitiously among her lace and pongee frillings poor mrs crowther disliked the guard's collar which she felt was writing premature wrinkles upon her younger girl's throat but she positively loathed the loose elegance of the indian silk tea-gown 
with its wide oriental sleeves exhibiting naked arms to the broad daylight that sloppy raiment made a discord in the subdued harmony of the visitor's tailor-made gowns well worn some of them brown and grey and indigo and russet and mrs crowther was tortured by the conviction that her elder daughter looked disreputable this honest matron was fond of isla disney in her own simple phraseology she had taken to her and pressed the girl-wife to come every thursday afternoon it must be so lonely for you she said gently with your husband so far away and you such a child too i wonder your mamma doesn't come and stay with you for a bit you must always come on our thursdays now mind you do my dear i don't think our thursdays are remarkably enlivening mother said alicia objecting to the faintest suggestion of fussiness the crying sin of both her parents and then she turned to isola and measured her from head to foot it's rather a pity you don't hunt she said we had a splendid morning with the hounds perhaps i may get a little hunting by and by when my husband comes home ah but one can't begin all at once and this is a difficult country breakneck hills and nasty banks have you hunted much hardly at all i was out in a boar hunt once near angers when only as a looker-on it was a grand sight the duke of pofor came over to brittany on purpose to join in it how glorious a boar hunt must be i must get my father to take me to angers next year do you know a great many people there no only two or three professors at the college and the marquis de quarangal the gentleman who has the boarhounds his daughter used to visit at dinan and she and i were great friends lord lostwithiel talked about boar hunting the other night said alicia it must be capital fun his name recurred in this way whatever the conversation might be with more certainty than zero on the wheel at roulette he had been there in the evening isola thought there had been a dinner-party perhaps at which he had been present she had not long to wonder the name once pronounced the stream of talk flowed on yes there had been a dinner and lord lostwithiel had been delightful so brilliant in conversation as compared with everybody else so witty so cynical so fin de siècle i didn't hear him say anything very much out of the common said mrs crowther in her matter-of-fact way she liked having a nobleman or any other local magnate at her table but she had too much common sense to be hypnotized by his magnificence and made to taste milk and water as maronean wine do you know lord lostwithiel belinda asked languidly as isola sipped her tea sitting shyly in the broad glare of a colossal fireplace oh yes by the by you met him here the week before last mrs disney blushed to the roots of those soft tendril-like curls which clustered about her forehead but she said never a word she had no occasion to tell them the history of that meeting in the rain or of those many subsequent meetings which had drifted her into almost the familiarity of an old friendship they might take credit to themselves for having made her acquainted with their star if they liked she had seen plenty of smart people at dinan in those sunny summer months when visitors came from dinard to look at the old quiet inland city lostwithiel's rank had no disturbing influence upon her mind it was himself something in his look and in his voice in the mere touch of his hand an indescribable something which of late had moved her in his presence and made her faintly tremulous at the sound of his name he was announced while they were talking of him and he seemed surprised to come suddenly upon that slim unobtrusive figure almost hidden by belinda's flowing garment and fuller form belinda was decidedly handsome handsomer than an heiress need be but she was also just a shade larger than an heiress need be at three-and-twenty 
she was a rubens beauty expansive florid and fair with reddish auburn hair piled on the top of her head sitting between this massive beauty and the still more massive chimney-piece mrs disney was completely hidden from the new arrival he discovered her suddenly while he was shaking hands with belinda and his quick glance of pleased surprise did not escape that young lady's steely blue eyes not a look or a breath ever does escape observation in a village drawing-room even the intellectual people the people who devour all moody's most solid books travels memoirs metaphysics agnostic novels even these are as keenly interested in their neighbours thoughts and feelings as the unlettered rustic in the village street lostwithiel took the proffered cup of tea and planted himself near mrs disney with his back against the marble caryatid which bore up one half of the chimney-piece alicia began to talk to him about his yacht how were the repairs going on and so on and so on delighted to air her technical knowledge he answered her somewhat languidly as if the vendetta were not first in his thoughts at this particular moment what about this ball he asked presently you are all going to be there of course do you mean the hunt ball at lost with you of course what other ball could i mean it is the great festivity of these parts the one tremendous event of the winter season it was a grand idea of you new people to revive the old festivity which had become a tradition i wore my first dress coat at the lost with you hunt ball nearly twenty years ago i think it was there i first fell in love with a young lady in pink tulle who was miserable because she had been mistaken enough to wear pink at a hunt ball i condoled with her assured her that in my eyes she was lovely although her gown clashed that was her word i remember with the pink coats my coat was not pink and i believe she favoured me a little on that account she gave me a good many waltzes in the course of the evening and i can answer for her never wearing that pink frock again for i trampled it to shreds there were traces of her to be found all over the rooms as if i had been greenacre and she my victim's body it will be rather a humdrum ball i'm afraid said belinda all the best people seem to be away never mind that if the worst people can dance i am on the committee so i will answer for the supper and the champagne you like a dry brand of course miss crowther i never touch wine of any kind no then my chief virtue will be thrown away upon you are all young ladies blue ribbonites nowadays i wonder mrs disney pray tell me you are interested in the champagne question i am not going to the ball not going oh but it is a duty which you owe to the county do you think because you are an alien and a foreigner you can flout our local gaieties fleer at our solemnities no it is incumbent upon you to give us your support yes my dear you must go to the ball put in mrs crowther in her motherly tone you are much too young and pretty to stay at home like cinderella while we are all enjoying ourselves of course you must go mr crowther has put down his name for five-and-twenty tickets and i'm sure there'll be one to spare for you although we shall have a large house-party indeed you are too kind but i couldn't think faltered isola with a distressed look she knew that lostwithiel was watching her from his vantage-ground ever so far above her head a man of six feet two has considerable advantages at a billiard-table and in a quiet flirtation carried on in public if it is a chaperon you are thinking about i'll take care of you urged good mrs crowther no it isn't on that account mrs bainham offered to take me in her party but i really would much rather not be there it would seem horrid to me to be dancing in a great dazzling room among happy people while martin is in burma perhaps in peril of his life on that very night one can never tell i often shudder at the thought of what may be happening to him while i am sitting quietly by the fire and what should i feel at a ball 
i should hardly have expected you to have such romantic notions about major disney said belinda coolly considering the difference in your ages do you suppose i care the less for him because he is twenty years older than i am twenty is it really as much as that ejaculated mrs crowther unaffectedly shocked he is just as dear to me pursued isola warmly i look up to him and love him with all my heart there never was a better truer man from the time i began to read history i always admired great soldiers i don't mean to say that martin is a hero only i know he is a thorough soldier and he seemed to realize all my childish dreams she had spoken impetuously fancying that there was some slight towards her absent husband in miss crowther's speech her flash of anger made a break in the conversation and nothing more was said about her going or not going to the hunt ball they talked of that entertainment in the abstract discussed the floor the lighting the band and the great people who might be induced to appear if the proper pressure were put upon them there is plenty of time said lostwithiel between now and the twenty second of december nearly three weeks time for you and your sister to get new frocks from london or paris miss crowther you mean having new frocks i suppose one generally does have a new frock for a dance replied belinda though the fashions this winter are so completely odious that i would much rather appear in a gown of my great-grandmother's lostwithiel smiled his slow secret smile high up in the fainter firelight he was reflecting upon his notion of miss crowther's great-grandmother in linsey woolsey with a lavender print apron a costume that would be hardly impressive at a hunt ball he did not give the young lady credit for a great-grandmother from the society point of view there was the mother yonder in offensive respectability the grandmother would be humbler and the great-grandmother he imagined at the wash-tub or cooking the noontide meal for an artisan husband he had never yet realized the idea of numerous generations of middle-class life upon the same plane the same dead level of prosperous commerce isola rose to take leave after having let her tea get cold and dropped half her cake on the persian rug she felt shyer in that house than in any other she had a feeling that there she was weighed in the balance and found wanting that unfriendly eyes were scrutinizing her gloves and hat and appraising her features and complexion she felt herself insignificant colourless insipid beside that brilliant miss crowther with her vivid beauty and her self-assured airs and graces tabitha urged her to be of good heart when she hinted at these feelings why lord have mercy upon us ma'am however grand they may all look it's nothing but wool only wool and i heard there used to be a good deal of devil's dust mixed with it after this mr crowther came into the business the dusk was thickening as she went along the short avenue which led to the gates mr crowther having built his house in a wood had been able to cut himself out a carriage drive which gave him an avenue of more than two centuries growth and thus imparted an air of spurious antiquity to his demean he felt as he looked at the massive boles of those old spanish chestnuts as if he had belonged to the soil since the commonwealth even the lodge was an important building tudor on one side and monastic on the other with that agreeable hodgepodge of styles which the modern architect loveth it was a better house than the curate lived in as he often told miss crowther isola quickened her pace outside that solemn gateway and seemed to breathe more freely she hurried even faster at the sound of a footstep behind her though there was no need for nervous apprehensions at that early hour in the november evening on the high road between fowey and trelasco did she know that firm quick footfall or was it an instinctive avoidance of an unknown danger which made her hurry on till her heart began to beat stormily and her breath came in short gasps my dear mrs disney do you usually walk as if for a wager asked a voice behind her i can generally get over the ground pretty fast but it was as much as i could do to overtake you without running he was not breathless however 
his tones were firm and tranquil it was she who could scarcely speak i'm afraid i am very late she answered nervously for what for afternoon tea by your own fireside have you anybody waiting for you at the angler's nest that you should be in such a hurry to get home no there is no one waiting except tabitha i expect no one then why walk yourself into a fever tabitha gets fidgety if i am out after dusk then let tabitha fidget it will be good for her liver those adipose people require small worries to keep them in health you mustn't overpace yourself to oblige tabitha she had slackened her steps and he was walking by her side looking down at her from that superb altitude which gave him an unfair advantage how could she upon her lower level escape those searching glances she knew that her way home was his way home so far as the bend of the road which led away from the river and to avoid him for the intervening distance would have been difficult she must submit to his company on the road or make a greater effort than it was in her nature to make you mean to go to this ball don't you he asked earnestly i think not oh but pray do why should you shut yourself from all the pleasures of this world and live like a nun always you might surely make just one exception for such a grand event as the hunt ball you have no idea how much we all think of it hereabouts remember it will be the first public dance we have had at lost with you for ever so many years you will see family diamonds enough to make you fancy you are at st james's do you think major disney would dislike your having just one evening's dissipation oh no he would not mind he is only too kind and indulgent he would have liked me to spend the winter with my sister in hans place where there would have been gaieties of all kinds but i don't want to go into society while martin is away it would not make me happy but if it made some one else happy if it made other people happy to see you there oh but it would not matter to anybody i am a stranger in the land people are only kind to me for my husband's sake your modesty becomes you as the dew becomes a rose i won't gainsay you only be sure you will be missed if you don't go to the ball and if you do go well it will be an opportunity of making nice friends it will be your debut in county society without my husband please don't say any more about it lord lostwithiel i had much rather stay at home he changed the conversation instantly asking her what she thought of glenaveril i think the situation most lovely yes there we are all agreed mr crowther had the good taste to find a charming site and the bad taste to erect an architectural monstrosity a chimera in red brick there was a grange once in the heart of that wood and the crowthers had the advantage of acorns and chestnuts that sowed themselves while the sleepy old monks were telling their beads how do you like miss crowther i hardly know her well enough to like or dislike her she is very handsome so was reuben's wife helena foreman but what would one do in a world peopled with helena foremans there are galleries in antwerp which no man should enter without smoke-coloured spectacles if he would avoid being blinded by a blaze of red-haired beauty i am told that the miss crowthers will have at least a million of money between them in days to come and that they are destined to make great matches perhaps we shall see some of their soupirants at the ball since the decay of the landed interest the chasse d'eau has become fiercer than of old this seemed to come strangely from him who had already been talked of as a possible candidate for one of the miss crowthers it would be such a particularly suitable match mrs Bainham, the doctor's wife had told isola what could his lordship look for beyond a fine fortune and a handsome wife they would make such a splendid pair said mrs Bainham, talking of them as if they were carriage horses mrs disney and her companion crossed a narrow meadow from the high road to the river path which was the nearest way to the angler's nest the river went rippling by under the gathering grey of the november evening on their right hand there was the gloom of dark woods and from the meadow on their left rose a thick white mist like a sea 
that threatened to swallow them up in its phantasmal tide the sound of distant oars dipping with rhythmical measure was the only sound except their own voices did that three quarters of a mile seem longer or shorter than usual isola hardly knew but when she saw the lights shining in tabitha's kitchen and the fire glow in the drawing-room she was glad with the gladness of one who escaped from some fancied danger of ghosts or goblins lost with you detained her at the gate good-night he said good-night you will change your mind won't you mrs disney it is not in one so gentle as you to be inflexible about such a trifle say that you will honour our ball she drew herself up a little as if in protest against his pertinacity i really cannot understand why you should care whether i go or stay away she said coldly oh but i do care it is childish perhaps on my part but i do care i care tremendously more than i have cared about anything for a long time it is so small a thing on your part it means so much for me say you will be there is that you ma'am asked tabitha's pleasant voice while tabitha's substantial souls made themselves audible upon the gravel path i was beginning to get fidgety about you good-night said isola shortly as she passed through the gate it shut with a sharp little click of the latch and she vanished among the laurels and arbutus he heard her voice and tabitha's as they walked towards the house in friendly conversation mistress and maid there was a great overblown dijon rose nodding its heavy head over the fence roses linger so late in that soft western air lost with you plucked the flower and pulled off its petals one by one as he walked towards the village street will she go will she stay go stay go stay he muttered as the petals fluttered to the ground go yes of course she will go he said to himself as the last leaf fell does it need ghost from the grave or rose from the garden to tell me that end of chapter three